I got the horn, buddy. Episode 164 of Radio Free Intimate. Are you excited? I'm going to lie, but Don't you fucking know something? Ah, this is not good. Are you not entertained? That's more fucking like it. All right, so last week I said that this episode was going to be about something I had teased in a prior episode. Because this week we are going to be talking about Dungeon Synth. So, uh, what the hell is Dungeon Synth? You might ask. Well, it's kind of interesting in that it's pretty much always existed since, uh, second wave black metal started up in Norway. It kind of didn't really exist as a concept until, like, the early 2010s when, uh, there was a blog. I don't know if it's around anymore, but it was one very dedicated person that started cataloging all of these old sort of weird, uh, dark wave psychedelic synth dark ambient projects that a lot of black metal people back in the day like to indulge in. And he started pointing out what made this kind of its own separate thing. And people really liked it because of how flowery the language was and how good he made the music sound. And it ended up becoming a genre that people actually started publishing their work in. So it's sort of like an astroturfed term, but I think it's actually pretty helpful because like nowadays people say stupid stuff. You see lots of these like four word abbreviation genres. People say OSDM for old school death metal like that's its own separate thing and i'm like oh you mean death metal it actually sounds like death metal Get fuck, man. here's a novel fucking concept for you uh that's actually called death metal and then this new stuff that apparently needs to be differentiated from quote unquote old school death metal is more properly uh, termed as garbage <laughs> Thank you for the emotional support. But Dungeon Synth, as a, an artificial term that was sung into existence by the elder graybeards of metal autism upon the summit of Mount Blogspot, is actually a very useful concept because before people started saying Dungeon Synth, people called this shit like dark ambient or dark wave. You know something, mean gene. Whenever you see dark in a genre descriptor, as far as I can tell, it means absolutely nothing. Like you see the word dark metal, and it either means literally a genre that only Bethlehem plays or else it's Lacuna Coil. Dark Ambient apparently is either all of this dungeon synth shit we're talking about or else it's like Lust Mord, which sounds nothing like it. So fuck that shit. We're calling it Dungeon Synth. The primary exponents of what would later on become Dungeon Synth were of course good old Varg. So how do you like your cornflakes? You know, do you like them crispy or do you like them soft? And I said, well, I like them crispy. With the more keyboard based tracks on some of the earlier Burzum stuff and then his mid-career shit that was all done on keyboards. Then you got like Satir from Satyricon doing his Wonegrave inside project. You got Summoning from Austria who pretty much always kept it black metal, but they were a big influence on the Dungeon Synth stuff. And then you have like the epic great granddaddy of the entire genre, good old Mortis. I'm filled with void and emptiness and darkness and pollution, Mortis. Filled with urine, feces, and pus, Mortis. Isn't that exciting? All the good things in life, Mortis. Who was sort of an interesting side character to the black metal scene because he started out with Emperor. That's right, that Emperor. He was the bassist, but also he was the primary lyricist. And I think his lyrics kind of really established Emperor's general atmosphere in their early years. It's kind of funny that Emperor is kind of one of the first black metal bands people hear, but it went around like vomiting out members that ended up doing like much more inaccessible shit later on. Like back when they were called Thou Salt Shuffer, you had Ildjarn in the band. Ildjarn, the most alienated, nasty, minimalist black metal act of all time. He got his start back when Emperor was a death metal band, and that's actually why Ishan does vocals on some uh, early Ildjarn stuff. But that's besides the point. Mortis was primarily there as like a lyricist and just sort of like a general atmosphere setter, but he kind of wasn't really feeling the black metal thing anymore, so he struck out on his own. He started up his own label card, Dark Dungeon Music, which is where we get the term dungeon synth from. And in a fit of insane late teenage ambition, he put out the first Mortis demo, which is one hour long song. The thing about early Mortis and just like a lot of general dungeon synth that makes it kind of hard to cover on a more metal oriented show like this is that it's much less about like riff to riff 
progression, counterpoint and such, and more about meditating on a singular idea and then like layering things on top of it. So if you were to look into like classical music, death metal and black metal, a lot closer to the Germanic mode of uh, songwriting. And then dungeon synth is a lot closer to like Slavic classical music. And interestingly enough, uh, Varg said his biggest classical music influence was Tchaikovsky, and that of course is Slavic. And a lot of like the second wave of people that would later on be called dungeon synth came out of Slavic countries. Countries like Kinyaz Vargoth from a Nocturnal Mortem's side projects, Vetcha and Mystigo Vargoth Orchestra. But when I'm talking about meditating on a singular idea, whew, this first Mortis Emma is a doozy. It's called The Song of a Long Forgotten Ghost. This piano bit right here is actually the backbone of the entire song. It's the first thing you hear on the album, and uh, pretty much all of it is just structured around that simple note sequence with little bits of uh, layering on top of it. Dungeon Synth is also much more focused on texture as opposed to like super memorable melodies that stick in your head. It's kind of like black metal in that it's lo-fi on purpose for effect. But yeah, like as you can tell here, it's all basically based around that piano fixture from the uh, beginning of the song. He's just slightly rearranging the notes over time. I have substantially edited this because like I said, it's an hour long song and we're like actually about 20 minutes into it. So definitely not the Mortis album to start with if you're new to the genre and you can't handle that sort of repetition. But for my money, it's one of my favorites. And the melodies get slightly more complex as the track progresses. So there is some counterpoint going on. It's not like completely a meditation but it's still very repetitive and very slow and not very like impact oriented. And we come back to the uh, main melody here. These keyboards are so like warbly and lo-fi sounding, I love them. And then there are some abrupt transitions like right here. He's specifically using like more dissonant chords on the piano to generate tension, heading into a more percussive section of the piece. But yeah, that's the song of a long forgotten ghost. And then we get kind of like the three big classic Mortis albums. The first one, uh, Fud, 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 uh, Fud, Fud, Yeah, that. It means born to rule. You are a dumb idiot. It was very much a, a continuation of the song of a long forgotten ghost demo with a very somber, subdued atmosphere and heavy usage of piano. But the second Mortis full length, Onden Som Jorde Opre, or uh, The Spirit Who Rebelled, was a much more martial affair. This was actually the first Mortis I got into. This one pretty much ditches the piano and kind of ditches anything that could even be considered dark ambient because it's not very dark, it's very brash. And like I said earlier on, very martial, very warlike, which uh, makes sense since this is an album about the one who rebelled, AKA, uh, you know. Have these really martial drum beats in the background. The melodies are much more distinct on this album. And this is kind of where Mortis starts using his really famous brass section with like all the horns and stuff. This was my first Mortis. I bought it at a uh, record store because I knew he was an emperor. And I was maybe like 16 or 17, and I fucking loved it. A lot of people would say it's a bit too repetitive, but I don't know. I think this music has enough motion to it to carry it forward. I'm never bored on it. Also, healthy dose of compositional dynamics. It does get quiet occasionally, like it does right here. With the uh, blowing wind noises, that synthesized flute. Perfect. Love this album. And it's got some spooky narration. You gotta like that. So that's, yeah, that's a good Mortis album. The one after it is probably a bit more famous because it's the one that he did a really long music video for. The name of that one, of course, is uh, Kaiser of N Dimension Ushent, Emperor of an Unknown Dimension, which, like the two preceding Mortis albums, is only two songs like Side A, Side B. He did the video for Side A, which is entitled Reisne til Grotor Ald Udemarker, Journeys the Caves and Wastelands. Ah, you gonna not Shh, don't call me out for actually knowing how to say these. You're breaking kayfabe for a prior joke on this episode. 
this journey is substantially more ambient and subdued than the uh, prior very martial campaign. This is probably the closest he gets to like the Burzum synth stuff, where it's like just a lot more laid back and uh, atmospheric, less in your face with the martial drum beats and such. And I like this one just about as much. I think it's interesting that like Mortis is characterized as just some goofy dude doing like bog standard keyboard progressions for hours on end that all sound the same because I find there'd be a high degree of variety in early Mortis. Like you almost would have a hard time believing it's the same guy if you didn't see him. Well, oh, watch out <laughs> on the album cover there with his uh goofy ears and a fake nose and like witch makeup this one also has clean vocals on it they were slightly present on the uh, very first Mortis album but on this one he really takes advantage of this like very dreamy kind of atmosphere he can generate with his voice linked up with all of these different synthesized orchestral instruments so of course this one's another very good album he's actually signed to earache of all labels at this point and through them he put out a book secrets of my kingdom return to dimensions unknown which is sort of just him describing in very poetic terms this kind of world that he created for his uh music to be the soundtrack to after that he put out a whole bunch of eps that were then compiled as the crypt of the wizard album this one's cool because all the songs are pretty short like six to eight minutes and there's a lot more uh, variety and pacing and tone, so it might be a better one to start with. <laughs> yeah, we probably should have let off the episode with Crypt of the Wizard, but I felt like doing the chronological thing. Anyways, this one gets a lot darker and aggressive on some of the songs than uh, we're used to hearing from Mortis. Maybe building off the more uh, martial strains of the second album. Quite a bit quicker pace, too. But yeah, very much like marching off the war on the uh, first EP that's included on this album. Also, probably the closest he ever got to doing something that sounds like it could have been like JRPG background music. Very Breath of Fire. But definitely a good Mortis to start out with. But then there's plenty of stuff that's very subdued. This one's called A Circle of Cosmic Chaos. And uh, it's interesting because it's got this very innocent sounding part right here. These kind of like very glowing textured synths. But then it's going to uh, transition into the actual circle of that cosmic chaos after we get through, you know, like these parts. It goes back and forth between this kind of like very calm stuff, which, you know, good to fall asleep to maybe. But then <laughs> you're going to wake your ass up when it gets all, um, uh... yeah, buddy. Okay, that actually is dark ambient. This could be like Lust Mortis or something. That's fucking nasty. Crypt of the Wizard, probably the best Mortis album to uh, start with. And then we get to uh, the Stargate, wherein he started using a lot more like actual acoustic instruments, and he hired as a uh, female vocalist, Sarah Jezebel Diva from... Uh Yeah, that's what's up. Cradle of Filth. Oh no. We won't hold that against her though, because she did a bang up job on this album and she took Mortis's work a lot more seriously than uh, most of the posers out there do. A lot of uh, modern day dungeon synth people tend to disregard this album because it uses so many acoustic instruments and like actual voices and stuff. I, however, find it to be a very interesting evolution of Mortis's sound and I would highly recommend giving it a shot. Definitely almost sort of like a neo-folk vibe, and then also a lot of, like, psychedelic electronic stuff going on. Also, somewhat comparable to uh, Dead Can Dance, who uh, kind of were always a specter that was haunting the backgrounds of uh, Mortis's cobwebbed-up castle. So Stargate, good stuff. Around the same time, he started up three projects. One of them's called Vond. Uh, the first Vond album sounds a lot like Mortis. The other two are mostly based around movie samples, so I wasn't huge on those. But uh, another one, Kunte Chile Diavolui, or uh, The Devil's Songs, is evidenced by the uh, Romanian name for the project. This was very much like a vampiric-inspired affair but a different take on vampires than uh, what you normally get out of black metal where there's sort of like a creeping sexual menace. And it's not really romantic either. It's mostly just very dusty and depressive sounding, almost kind of morbidly humorous. And it's actually some of my favorite stuff from Mortis. 
it has completely different synth patches than what he usually uses. And it all kind of has this weird sort of like dark dance feel to it with quite a bit of psychedelia mixed in as well. So I would highly recommend this project. I really like the weird kind of like very synthetic tone he used for the flute on this. It contributes heavily to the atmosphere of despair, but not passionate despair, like dispassionate despair. It's hard to explain, but if you listen to the whole thing, you'll see where I'm coming from. And he started up another project I liked a lot called uh, Feta Morgana. Hey, 네, 여러분, 안녕하세요. 오늘은... Nope, we're not jumping back into metal just yet, lady. <laughs> the first uh, Fade of Morgana album sounded a whole lot like a more subdued and uh, catchy version of Mortis. If you listen to my episode on uh, Dies Irae and Cruciamentum, I actually used a sample from that as the intro. But then he put out a 7-inch under the same band name, and it's some of the weirdest and most interesting stuff that Mortis ever did, and I haven't seen like much of anybody talk about it. Even the dungeon synth people tend to give it a pass, but... <laughs> This is very much him playing against type. Uh, there's a whole lot of Kraftwerk influence on this. Or Kraftwerk, if you want to get all Germanic. It's also very fast. But you can hear like those old Mortis synths being utilized in like a new, very like dance music oriented way. And I think it's pretty cool. It's called Space Race, if you couldn't tell. He says it like 30 times. And then watch this part right here. It's those same Mortis string synths way back from like the second album. They're back, but he's using them to do this kind of weird dance music, but also still like dungeon synth thing. I don't know. It might have predicted where he was going to go later on because for years, uh, Mortis pretty much entirely disavowed his earlier dungeon synth period and went into like sort of a early nine inch nails kind of like goth dance cyber thing that I didn't really care for. Apparently, he's since reconciled with his uh, earlier material because he's been remastering it and re-recording old songs, so we might even get an entirely new Mortis Dungeon Synth album at some point. That might be interesting. But I feel like Mortis, that's a good introduction to Dungeon Synth. If people like this, uh, I'll probably do some more Dungeon Synth episodes because I like that stuff, even if everybody else hates it. And I will see you around next time. Now, I was going to have a dentist appointment on work on Monday. But my dentist office that I go to, they called and they were rescheduled for tomorrow. And people on YouTube have made comments saying I need to brush my teeth more often. And yes, I have a bad habit of doing that. And I have gotten a lot better at doing that because my teeth in recent videos, they don't look as yellow as they used to. So I'm definitely getting better at that. The last thing I'd want is to be 30 years old and wearing dentures. That would kind of suck.